Welcome to this very special edition of Rubbing Minds. In the month of March, we do celebrate International Women's Month and we are bringing the conversation to Nigeria as we focus and shine the light on iconic Nigerian women who have made a change. Now, our guest today is somebody who has sacrificed herself. She's put herself in the line of fire all because of her beliefs and all because she wanted to see a positive change. Dr. Jo Okeo Dumakin is an iconic woman by any standard anywhere in the world. She's been arrested more times than anybody can count, but she's also changed more lives than anybody can count. I can't wait to get into this discussion. It's certainly one that you will never forget. Dr. Josephine Obiadjulu Oke Odumakin has lived a better part of her life as an activist. She has traversed courageously where even some men fear to tread. She remained consistent without minding the hazards to her person in a society where critical voices are loathed by an unjust system which rewards the crook and punishes the just. Her consistency and unwavering determination for survival of democracy in Nigeria made Professor Wale Soyinka to describe her as a tireless fighter whose frail bearing bellies an inner strength and resilient purpose, a veteran of affirmative marches, of crude arrests and detentions, baton charges and tear gas, who has lent luster to the struggle for justice and human dignity, who remain an inspiration of men and women, old and young. She was recently honored in America with the Woman of Courage Award by Michelle Obama. The lady we're sitting with today is called a veteran of affirmative marches, to use the words of Wallace Soyinka, that's Dr. Joe Oke Odumakin. How are you, Dr. Oh, fine, my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Nice to you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a wonderful establishment. Wow. And uh, yeah, walking in, it was just breathtaking. I, I love what you have built. And Thank you. it's an inspiration. But we want to get straight to, let's start at the beginning of, of, of your journey. You were born into a family of all boys. <laughs> Uh, you know, did you ever feel like you wanted to do the things that other other little girls were doing? Because you described yourself as a tomboy from a young age. Well, it's not really that I I, I never felt like doing things that other young girls were uh -huh. doing. I first started out with mixing with boys, mm -hmm. and at times you see that some of them feel so special. They feel boss. Uh, they feel that they are the boss. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to mix with them break the genes and let them also realize that even as a woman that one will be better than them even growing up on the field i like to be uh, the captain mm -hmm. or goalkeeper things that boys we want to do i want to do it better you wanted to do it better where, where did you get this uh, the spirit to want to compete with boys and prove to them that you were you know you were equal or even better than them well i think it's uh, from my mom because uh, growing up i watched my mom as a princess and then I I see her do a lot of things. She settles quarrels, she confronts people, she hates injustice and she's always confrontational. So I see her, I admire her. Although at times she will scold me and I'll have to rethink if she was really my mom. But at last I just wonder that the discipline had helped me a lot. And I feel like that discipline continued on when you went to mission school. Tell me about the experience of you know being at a very staunch Catholic mission school. Yes, the thing really is that you know, as staunch Catholics, we, we started out when we were very young in, in church, confirmation, uh, the, the Holy Communion, a, a, lot, a lot of things happened. But my Christian religious studies teacher, Miss Tire, a missionary, I just liked, you know, her, and then our Reverend Father too. Mm -hmm. So I just felt that this boy I just, and it's true, they just married to Jesus all their life. You know, Jesus. So uh, when I was about to complete my secondary school, I was feeling the form. I also wanted to be married to Jesus. I never wanted any distraction. Mm -hmm. Then my mom saw me, and 
he had to call my dad in the U.S. And in those days, it's, it's not the mobile app, it's this phone on the table. <laughs> gave my dad called, gave us the time. We all sat around the table. Then he called and said, my loving daughter, because he always addressed me as a younger wife. Anything my mom does, I would like to even do more perfection. Oh. So my dad said, when he comes out from the U.K., that he will disown me. I told the Reverend Father, the Reverend Sister, I said, it's your earthly father. If he likes, let him disown you. Your heavenly father is the most important and must not disown you. So my father came back. He still knew that I was adamant. And he just said, young girl, I'm going to put your obituary in one of these papers. So when people see you, they will think you are a ghost, spirit, they will start running from you. I could not bear it. At night, I cried throughout the night. And then in the morning, I just told my dad, I said, I want to go to school. So he took me to Kwara State Polytechnic for my A-levels. And then when I, I got there, he took me to the director, Dr. Acho, yes. that I should be living with him. But the wife was so strict. You have not done this. After some few days, I went to my dad in the office. I said, please, I don't want to leave there. I want to go to the hostel. So he then agreed. He told the director, Dr. Acho. And then went, he, opened, he bought 60 leaves notebook. So in the morning, I signed. You evening had to clock in clock for your movements. Yes. Wow. So it was at last that one day I saw one sample of uh, left foot movements, mm. and then I went for their meeting. That's so, rethink Nigeria. Yes, yes, the rethink Nigeria. Yeah. And then getting there, I looked at the agenda. I still believed in the power of prayers. I said, "There's no opening and no closing prayer. Why?" So they argued and argued. They said we're doing very important things, discussing mm. Nigeria, national. So they threw me out. And then after about two weeks, one of them saw me and said, Reverend Sister, we'll put it, come for a meeting. Yeah. So I was so happy I got there again. Opening or closing prayer wasn't there. So this time I ran, they were violent, held my shirt, flung me out, and I even they didn't allow me to take one leg of my slippers that I wore to the meeting. Yeah. So after that, I said I will never. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do that until I didn't go for any other meeting until I got to the University of Illinois. Wow. Okay, we're still going to explore some of the, because it feels like that was the beginning of a lot of brutal experiences exactly. that you encountered. But I want to go back to your desire to be a nun, because I feel that somehow you wanted to serve. And that's one thing that's continued throughout your life. You've got the spirit to serve people. You know, when, when did you really decide? What was that moment when you felt like, you know what, I want to give my life to serving people? I just wanted to serve God. I wanted to be married to Jesus. Mm. So when that one was truncated, and then I continued with my studies, mm -hmm. after that, I got into the University of Illinois. Yes. I still wanted to be a man. I just wanted to, I never wanted any distraction. Mm. So one day, a lecturer said, measured my matriculation number, and said the person scored very high marks in the test that was conducted. Very strict lecturer. And that the person should see, come to the office after the lecture. Mm -hmm. So my friends saw me and said, Paul, I said, Reverend Sister, did you stretch your neck, you know, because, you know, cheating in those days, <laughs> yes. if anything happened. I said, no. In fact, when the lecturer gives us test, I will almost develop stiff neck, because you dare don't. You know, so I went, I, my friend said, Reverend Sister, so the lecturer said, what's your problem? I said, are you a stamra? I said, no, he said, come, come, come. So we got to the office. He said, what's your problem? Why were you pointing at me? I said, no, you, said, <laughs> and then I just found the courage and I said, my matriculation my number was mentioned, I said, you scored very high marks. You, are, you can't tell me that you're stamina. Be confident. So I became confident. He then said, you want to be married to Jesus? I said, yes. I said, take this book and read. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you three days. After that, let's discuss. It's the uh, autobiography of uh, Martin Luther King. You know, so I read it like I was reading the Bible. But one quotation, which then says that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Apart from wanting to serve, mm -hmm. there are some anomalies that I've seen, military dictatorship, mm -hmm. which was an aberration. I've seen things go wrong. I've seen flagrant violations of fundamental human rights. Mm -hmm. I'll just look, not that I'll totally look the other way, but I'll just feel that, well, someone else that is concerned will do that. Yeah. I will do some other things, like cheating. When I'm in school, you collect someone's pencil, you collect someone's biro, mm -hmm. then I, but there are bigger interventions that I just found that 
it was another person would do it. Okay. So when I read that, and I went back to the lecturer in 1985, we discussed it. I became a changed person. So I just felt that all that I want to do, I will confront evil, mm -hmm. brace up dictatorship. Yeah. Because like Albert Pike says that, what we do for ourselves dies with us. Mm -hmm. But what we do for others, and the world remains. Yes. So that changed myself. And immediately I called the lawyer, prepare my will because I'm going to confront. Wow. Okay, so you, 